Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to discuss today is America's industrial revolution, steam industry and clothing. And along the way, we're gonna meet steam tractors, poison dresses, a pink river, and the most expensive jeans in the world. We're gonna follow that outline right up above my little yellow box. So put that in your notes so you have a framework for the information that's about to follow because we're going to build an answer to that question right there. And the question is, was America's industrial age a golden age, a gilded age, or a dark age? Evaluate the historical events between 1860 and 1920 in terms of society, politics, and the economy, and develop an argument that supports one of these three interpretations of this critical period in American history. Because we are talking about the Industrial Revolution, the industrialization of America, that turns it from a small rural nation into one of the great industrial powerhouses of the world. Because what happens in the United States at the end of the 19th century is actually termed by historians to be the second industrial revolution. Now, the first industrial revolution was the mechanical agricultural improvements that took place in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century. This includes uh, mechanical assistance like the cotton gin or the McCormick Reaper. Up there on the upper left, that's a very small textile mill. It might have one or 200 workers and it might churn out in the course of a year, maybe a thousand or maybe 10,000 yards of cloth. Very, very small scale and nothing compared to what we're gonna find later. But you see what begins to happen in the 1840s and the 1850s is a very slow turn towards widespread improvements in industry and manufacturing. Now, uh, industrializa industrialization itself can kind of be summed up as four very distinct things. Mechanization, innovation, standardization, and specialization. Mechanization is the application of mechanical power to these factories, first in the form of steam and later in the form of electricity. Two is innovation. Workers and engineers and capitalists are constantly seeking a way to improve designs, to improve these machines, to get more power, to get more efficiency, to produce more and more. Standardization is the standardizing of everything of every aspect of mechanical production. All of the nuts are the same size. All of the screws are the same size. And as we'll see, all of the threads are the same width. And four is specialization. Instead of having a man, one person, build a car from the ground up, you would have 40 people each doing one specific task. And altogether, they're churning out products in large, large scales. And all of this takes place in things like, well, that bicycle factory right up above my head, where they are turning out bicycles by the hundred and then by the thousands and then by the tens of thousands. And it all gets started with hot water, steam. And that's what you see right up above me, the steam engine. Because by 1850, this is making greater and greater use of practical steam engines with the mechanical power of the engine replacing human and animal power. Now, at first, steam engines are used for fairly simple things. Water pumps, steam ships, uh, and locomotives. But very soon, both small and large engines begin to be adapted for factories. Steam power is very, very useful. Now, and, and it was... Basically, you do it by burning a fuel. The fuel heats the water and the water expands. The expanded water is released, then it contracts, and then you heat the water again, producing a motion like you see in the animated picture right up above my head. Now, steam engines are very, very, very powerful. All right? They're very powerful engines. And we get a, a glimpse of that in what we're, this little clip we're going to watch right here. What you see right up above me is a steam tractor from the very end of the 19th century. I think it's like a 1906 steam tractor, and it's gonna engage a tug of war against a modern diesel John Deere tractor. And the modern tractor has no chance. Let's watch. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
And that steam tractor will eventually pull that modern diesel tractor apart because steam power is very, very, very powerful. But here's the problem with steam power. Steam engines explode. Uh, they have to be handled very, very well. They have to be maintained very, very well. Because after all, you are containing pressurized, extremely high temperature steam inside of a metal cylinder. And if you're, you know, if your maintenance isn't that good and you're not paying attention to where the screws are and you're not paying attention to how old the engine is, that steam engine can explode. And exploding steam engines and exploding uh, paddle wheel steamers, you know, killed hundreds of people every year. But now you've got the idea of how steam power works. So instead of taking you through every single step of the industrial revolution and how all of this power gets applied to production, what we're going to do is focus on a single industry, textiles, all right? And in the 1840s and in the 1850s, and especially by the 1860s and beyond, we start seeing the large scale application of industrial techniques to cloth production, to textiles. And these cute little textile mills of the 1820s and 1830s are dwarfed by the factories that are eventually created in the North. And the point of all of this textile production was in the end, beautiful, beautiful clothing. I mean, you can, you can say a lot about industrial age America. You can say a lot about the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. But one of the things you can't say about them is that they had ugly clothing. These people knew how to dress really well. I mean, it takes you like an hour to get into that dress, uh, but you look fantastic when you're inside of it. So what I want you to do right now what I want you to do is to look at these three dresses and I want you, you know, uh, if you are female, to pick which one of these you would wear, which one of these you think you would look best in. Is it A, that lovely blue dress, B, that beautiful green dress, or C, that lovely peach dress? Is that peach? It's kind of pinky peach. Anyway, in your notes, I want you to write down which is your favorite dress and why. And you could put any reason. I just want to know why. And of course, it, you could make ready-made clothing or like a lot of people in the industrial age, you could just buy uh, pre-made bolts of cloth and make your own dress. But I don't want to leave the fellas out because menswear in the industrial age was also really, really nice. So if you're a fella, what I want you to do in your notes is to pick a suit. Do you think you'd look better in A, that nice black evening wear? Uh, B, the kind of beigey, tan uh, golfing suit? Or the nice formal goose gray right up above me? C. And again, in your notes, I want you to pick an outfit and just explain to me which one you like, because that is what you would have purchased back in the Gilded Age. Now, let's actually apply these four things to the textile industry. Mechanization, innovation, standardization, and specialization. The first is mechanization. And in many of these textile plants, they would have a power plant nearby, either in the same building or next to the building. And that power plant was a massive steam engine that would be turning the powertrain, connecting it to machines throughout the factory. It's not electricity. You can't plug it into the wall. And those type of machines would involve things like this, the spinning mule and below the spinning mule, the power loom. Now, prior to the industrial revolution, you take raw cotton and you would spin it on a spinning wheel. I mean, that's the thing that Cinderella prick, pricked her finger on. And a spinning wheel, you know, spins the cotton. You roll the cotton around it and you connect it to a spindle. And that spindle, that's the sharp bit that, that pricked Cinderella. That spindle creates a tiny thread. And you sit there and you spin the cotton into cloth. And eventually, after a day, 
you end up with half of your spindle or most of your spindle full of high quality cotton cloth. But we can do better than that in the Gilded Age. We can do better than that in industrial America. What we're gonna do is we're going to redesign the spinning wheel. We're gonna shrink the wheels. We're gonna line up the spindles by the dozens, by the scores, and eventually by the hundreds. And we will eventually end up with a machine like that in the upper left, the spinning mule. And that is gonna be connected to a powertrain. And that powertrain is gonna be connected to some huge steam engine. And the spinning mule, by the time we get to the 1890s or 1900s, a single spinning mule could have anywhere between 700 and 1,000 individual spindles on it. Cinderella's old spinning wheel had one. And you would often have in these factories, not one, not two, not 10 spinning, spinning mules. You would have 1,000 of them working simultaneously. And then after the raw cotton has been spun into thread, you take the thread and you load it into the power loom. And the power loom shuttles it back and forth and is mechanically turning the thread into sheets of cloth. The sheets of cloth would then be moved to another part of the factory where the people would be lined up working as seamstresses. And instead of sewing things by hand, which is what everybody did in 1830, these bolts of cloth would be assembled into pre-made clothing using this radical new thing called the sewing machine. And the sewing machine is, is actually sewing machines are really complicated pieces of machinery. But you can see with the factory right up above me, you know, you would have a line of seamstresses sitting at these sewing machines, you know, for eight or nine or 10 hours a day, turning the loomed cloth into pre-made clothing. And every step of this production process is a machine. It's a person working a machine. Almost nothing is being done by hand. And it's all connected to that steam engine that's somewhere in the building. That's all mechanization. Two is innovation. Factories were constantly working on ways to improve these machines. How can we get more power out of the steam engine? How can we make the spinning mule more efficient? How can we make the power loom produce higher quality, higher count cloth? How can we make these sewing machines faster, easier, and easier to maintain? And eventually you end up with things like that right above me. That's eventually what the spinning mule turns into, an electrically powered uh, spinning mule. And my God, I think that thing has somewhere between 1,800 and 4,000 individual spindles in it incredibly dense, incredibly powerful machines. And these factories are constantly working on these machines, making them larger, making them more efficient, making them more powerful. This was even true on the factory floor. Workers were encouraged to tinker with their machines. Is there a way you can make the sewing machine faster? Is there a way you can make it easier to maintain? Indeed, inventing itself becomes something of a kind of mania in the United States in the late 19th century. And you can see in that chart on the upper left, that's the number of patents that are filed with the US Patent Office. And you can see literally right after about 1850, 1860, that line just leaps right up. As, as the Patent Office goes from accepting maybe 50 or 60 or 70 patents a year to accepting thousands of patents a year. Everyone is inventing something new. Everyone is trying to create something more powerful, more efficient. Because if you can create a better spinning mule, you'll be rich. And people got quite rich. And machines evolve very, very rapidly during this period as this sort of imagination of the American worker is unleashed. And you can see how sewing machines themselves go from these, these kind of odd, wrought iron mechanical contraptions to these very sleek, very high-tech designs. And again, you know, I always bump into one or two students in every class who's like really into sewing. And they always get really excited at this part of the lecture because my goodness, sewing machines, if you've ever like taken a sewing machine apart, they are actually incredibly complicated. I mean, look at that diagram on the left. It has these dozens of moving parts and a single worker at some point in time invented each of these tiny little moving parts. 
filed a patent, and made a small fortune off of their patent. Sewing machines are very complicated things. I mean, I don't really even know how they work. Our third thing is standardization. Now, again, prior to the Industrial Revolution, you know, you would have a person spinning cloth on their old spinning wheel. And, you know, on one day, they're paying a lot of attention and the cloth is very fine. On another day, they're going slow and the cloth is kind of coarse. But the thing about hand production of cloth is it's not consistent. It's not standardized. And how can you turn all of this non-standard thread into bolts of cloth to turn it into clothing if it's all different, if it's different every day? So one of the things the Industrial Revolution does is focus on standardization. I mean, if you look right above my head, these are standardized thread size. You've got lace thread, fingering lead, sport thread, DK lead, worsted, and finally, bulky. And each type of spinning mule is going to produce a different type of thread. And all of the threads will be standardized. There's going to be no guesswork when you take these individual threads and turn them into sheets of cloth to turn those cloth into clothing. Now, those are the standardization of threads there on the left, if I didn't screw it up. And you can see that the toleration uh, on the thread counts, on the, the size of the thread, you know, whether it is 1.5 millimeters or 5.5 millimeters, it's going to be the same every time. You can count on the standardization of the thread. And you could purchase spooled cotton thread and be assured that that thread was going to be of a standard size every single time. You could say, I want to buy fine thread or worsted or coarse thread, and it would be the same. There was no guesswork at all. And people liked this. It wasn't like this before the Industrial Revolution. And it wasn't just sort of the product that was standardized, but machine parts themselves became standardized. I mean, look at these drawings of a spinning mule in a power loom, and I want you to look at these wheels and belts and levers. They're all identical. Uh, if your spinning, one spinning mule breaks, you can take parts from another one and fix it because everything is being the same size. I mean, imagine working on a machine where all the screws and all the bolts are a different measurement because everything has been handmade. But with standardization, every bit of that machine was machined to a specific standard and you could just swap them out at will. Fourth is specialization. And again, this is individuals working at a power loom, working at a spinning mule, working at a sewing machine all day long. They specialized and they got pretty good at it. In fact, they got so good at it, they'd eventually be bored out of their minds. But follow the chart right up above my head. This is how you actually manufacture cloth. It starts with cultivation and harvesting and then goes to the preparation of yarn and the manufacture of yarn. That's the spinning, the spinning mule. Uh, there's a power loom over there on the lower left. Those two ladies are going to work at that power loom for their entire shift. And the next day they're going to come back to the factory and they're going to work on that power loom. They're not going to do preparation. They're not going to work one day on a spinning mule, another day on the sewing machine. All right. Each of those boxes right up above my head, that is a specialized worker's function. As the cloth goes from cultivation to yarn preparation, to the spinning mule, to the power looms where they are manufacturing the fabric, and then they're either going to sell the finished bolts of cloth or then move the bolts of cloth to the finishing room where they will be turned into preset clothing. And if you got hired at one of these factories, they would put you in one of those purple boxes right up above my head and that would be your job and you would get pretty good at it. You didn't have to learn 14 different steps in how to produce a shirt or how to produce a set of pants. You just needed to know how to work your machine. And you got pretty good at handling your machine because you were around it every day. And here are some of the steps in the production of cloth. Uh, I think on the upper left, that's the production of thread. Those are the spinning mules. Right up above me, those are the 
That's the power looms right up above me. And over there on the lower left, that's that's the that's the seamstresses. That's where they're turning the cloth into uh, ready to wear clothing. And every person is specializing at one particular job. They get good at it. They can do it very efficiently and they learn to work their machines. Now, sometimes this specialization gets absolutely ridiculous. This woman, she sits in front of that huge machine. That's a button making machine. And she spends eight to 10 hours a day making buttons. That's all that woman is gonna do. She's gonna sit in the front of that big machine and make buttons. She's a button maker because if you're gonna sell ready-made clothing, gotta have buttons to put on the clothes. And I want you to note something. Look at that chart on the left. All the buttons are standardized, all right? The buttons are all standardized. Before the Industrial Revolution, most clothes didn't have buttons. They used little clumps and knots of cloth to, to secure uh, the clothes shut. But since we're making ready-made clothing, making knots of cloth is too expensive. Buttons. You make a machine to make the buttons. You hire a worker to specialize making those buttons. And that person makes specialized buttons. And the result is, again, beautiful, beautiful clothing. All right? Uh, you can't fault the Gilded Edge for looking bad. They knew how to wear clothing. They would take the cotton, spin it into cloth, dye the cloth, cut the cloth, turn the cloth into an incredibly good-looking goose gray coat. Looks so nice. Or you can buy ready-made cloth and make your own. People, especially if you had money, you looked good in the industrial age. Now, here is one of the largest textile mills in North America. And this is a, this is a weird New England name, so I'm probably going to try to screw it up. I'm, I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly. It's the a most key textile mill in New Hampshire. By 1900, it is not even a single factory, but rather it is a massive complex of more than 30 individual textile mills. I mean, look at it there on the upper left. The bloody thing is gigantic. All of these 30 factories covered 15,000 acres. Every day walking into that complex were 17,000 employees each of them doing one particular job. There is the factory floor on the lower left. And what, what are those machines? Um, I think they're power looms, but I, I could be wrong on that. Anyway, coming, so in one side of the, of the textile mills would roll in raw cotton. On the other side of the textile mills would roll out 237 million yards of cloth per year. Now compare that to that cute little textile mill that I showed you in 1830 with 100 employees and could make, you know, a thousand yards of cloth a month. 237 million yards of cloth. Mechanization, innovation, standardization, specialization. This huge uh, warehouse room, if you'll notice the sign right there, it says, one day's product. This is an incredible level of production. Now, let's actually go into the textile mills. What are they looking? Let's look at the day of an average worker. There we go. Your shift is 11 hours long. You show up at 6.30 a.m. and you leave in the evening at 6.45 p.m. You have breakfast at 6 a.m., a dinner at noon, and you commence work after dinner at 12.45. And uh, across the factory, they ring these bells to let you know what time it is. There's the morning bells, the dinner bells. I think that's what they're calling lunch. And then the evening bells. So it's a highly regulated existence when you're working 11 hours a day in this factory. Well, was the pay good? Not really. Uh, if you look at that middle column, those are the rates for different positions. Because, of course, different jobs were at different levels, required different levels of expertise and quality. Some of them were quite valuable. A boss carter, a boss carter is going to get $12 a week. $12 a week! 
And that's obviously, that's a very good paying job. Let's look at something very simple, like, uh, I don't know, a drawing in girl. There she is, she's drawing the thread in. They are paid a solid $6 a week. And weavers, $5.45 every week. Let's see, 11 hours a day, five days a week. That's a 55 hour work day for $6 a week, $6 a week. Oh, look at the spinners. Spinners, the people working the spinning mules, $3 a week. So a 55 hour work week, $3 a week, working in front of one of those huge spinning mules. And they always wanted workers. Now, one of the things that kept the prices uh, so, so down so low was the massive influx of immigrants because people could always be replaced. And it was in one of these factories that Emma Goldman found herself in when she arrived in America, in New York, you know, a, a poor Jewish refugee, you know, from Imperial Russia. And there they are, 75 young women from 15 to 35 years of age wanted to work in the cotton mills. $3 a week for 55 hours each week. Spinning cloth. Now, these factories were not nice places to be. The factories were hot. The factories were loud. The factories were spill, filled with spinning machinery, flammable debris, toxic chemicals. Workplace accidents were commonplace. And one of the people they employed in the textile mills were children. Children's little hands could get in and out of the spinning machines very quickly. So you would have these loose threads and these little scrap bits of cloth would be whirling around inside these machines and it could gum up the machine or even cause it to seize up. So what you do is you hire a little eight, nine or 10 year old kid and they're gonna stand on one side of the machine and their job is to reach into all of this whirling spinning machinery and snatch out these little random bits of threads or cloth that can gum up the machine. But, but sometimes the kids were slow and the machines weren't calibrated correctly and their little hands would get stuck when a big gear whizzed around and it would pull the child directly into the spinning gears. Children were pulled into these spinning machines. Many workers would often lose fingers and sometimes entire hands. Many people in these machines with so much cloth dust all around, they developed coughs. Because they're hunched over a machine all day, they would develop twisted backs. And the factories themselves over time would fill up with grease, with oil, with random bits of cloth. And sometimes they would just burst into flame. And to prevent workers from slacking, they often locked the doors. These factories were very dangerous places because there's no OSHA in industrial America. Workplace accidents were very, very common. And what you see in these photographs are the result of those workplace accidents. People's legs, little kids' fingers, their thumbs would be ripped off or pulled into these machines. Between 1880 and 1900, 35,000 workers every year died in industrial accidents. And those are the people who die. Triple that number were injured or even crippled in accidents. So basically almost every year, somewhere between 100 and 150,000 people were being permanently scarred, permanently crippled by these huge, impersonal spinning machines. And some of them, of course, children. And this happened at the textile mill that we're talking about. In 1891, the steam engine powering the powertrain that's powering all of these looms and spinning jennies, uh, the steam engine at the carting factory in the Amoski textile mill exploded because that's what steam engines did sometimes. And what you're seeing right now is the results of the explosion of the steam engine. It instantly killed four people permanently crippled another 11. And what kind of blows my mind about this accident at this textile mill, it, it wasn't even seen as something surprising, all right? It wasn't even 
considered particularly noteworthy. In the newspaper of the time, it's buried on like page nine. It's just like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, the steam engine at the textile mill exploded. Yeah, killed four people. It was not considered a terribly newsworthy accident because stuff like that happened all the time. You worked very, very hard, you know, for your $3 a week, working over your machine for 11 hours a day. And sometimes that machine would rip you apart. Sometimes that machine would just explode in your face. And then if you were lucky, you were just crippled, but certainly you would be fired. And some of these accidents are really gruesome. Here is poor Miss Sabina Goudet. She wore her hair long, as was the fashion of the day, in one of these textile mills, and the long hair got caught in one of the spinning machines. And it scalped her. All right, it ripped her hair right off of her skull. She died. All right? These things happen. And also, there is a disease which was discovered at the end of the 19th century called mule spinner's cancer. Mule spinner's cancer. Now, uh, the mule spinners were generally uh, male uh, because these big, you know, these big machines, and you had to wrestle different parts of these big machines. And I want you to look at that uh, black and white photograph there on the, the uh, right next to me that the way it, it was, was that the powertrain for the mule spinners consisted of a single cylinder running in front that was spinning constantly. And so the men who would work on the mule spinners would be leaning over this spinning train and adjusting the machine, working on the machine, making sure that the, the spindles were all whirring correctly and the cotton was being turned into thread. And it was discovered that the men who kept working at this machines all kept developing the same kind of ailment. Mule spinners cancer. Because you see the lubricant along that shaft on the powertrain spinning in front of the uh, spinning mule was carcinogenic. It would give you cancer. And the men were leaning over it, which meant that thousands of men working on these mule spinners all developed testicular cancer because the carcinogenic oils were coating the front of their pants. And it's the 1880s, it's the 1890s, and you now have testicular cancer. Oh, good Lord. The treatment for testicular cancer in the 1880s and the 1890s was that they would cure you with soothing, balmy oils. You could get as much laudanum or opium as you would like and castration for your $3 a week. Now, these factories were also incredibly polluting. I promised you a pink river and there it is right up above my little yellow box. These factories produced significant levels of pollution. Coal-fired steam engines belched smoke into the air. Many of the dyes used for those fabulous colors were toxic, and they would simply dump the residue directly into the local river, contaminating water supply. Local rivers turned red, turned pink. Some rivers turned purple. Nature never knew anything like that. But there was one of these colors, one of these dyes, that was highly, highly prized and was very valuable a brilliant emerald green. Emerald green dresses, beautiful. And these dresses really are beautiful. And I want you to make a note if you picked that really pretty green dress about 15 minutes ago, because the color of that, this brilliant uh, green is called arsenic green. I mean, look at that dress on the upper left. Again, beautiful clothing. And the main chemical that was that enabled these, these uh, textile mills to get that really bright, brilliant green color, if you haven't figured it out already, was arsenic. Arsenic is a naturally green heavy metal. So they would use it as a dye to turn these dresses brilliant green in color. But arsenic is highly toxic, all right? Arsenic is incredibly dangerous. There is 
a, a tin of the dye today. And, you know, this is by the time they knew exactly how dangerous arsenic was. There it is, Paris Green, the dye made from arsenic with a big poison label on the front. And as people began to realize that these really popular green dresses were in fact slowly killing the women who wore them. That's the cartoon right up above my head as the skeleton in the evening dress bows to the pretty skeleton in the arsenic green dress as they dance the arsenic waltz. And we have some of these dresses left over from industrial America. And here they are, killer poison dresses. In fact, that dress on the left uh, is actually on display in I believe the Houston Museum of Natural Science. The dress hasn't faded one tiny bit in the 130 years it's been there. It's still as brilliant as the day it, may, it was made and it is still toxic to the touch. It's behind about a quarter inch of glass and every time the museum curators have to move the dress or clean the dress, they basically have to wear these lead lined heavy rubber gloves to do it. And you can see it right up in the story above me. History's killer fashion, arsenic poison dresses on display. So if in our little clothing exercise earlier, you picked the green dress, I have some bad news for you. You're going to be poisoned by your beautiful dress. This is what heavy metal poisoning looks like. Uh, you develop skin cancers, you develop lesions, you have nausea, a loss of appetite, jaundice, a touch of cirrhosis, tremors, difficulty in walking, hypertension. But bizarrely enough, some young women liked the arsenic dresses because it made you very, very skinny, which was the fashion at the time. I mean, it's, it's slowly filling your body with heavy metal poisoning, but at least you look good while you're dying. Now, textiles are just a single example. Now I could have taken the exact thing with, uh, with steel production or with coal mines or with railroads. The exact same sequence is playing through in terms of mechanization, uh, innovation, standardization, and specialization. You know, all of these things, the, the, the same qualities are being played out in all of these industries, and they're all producing the exact same kind of, of result. Incredible wealth, incredible levels of production, but loud, incredibly dangerous factories. Look at this painting of a steel factory. I mean, it looks like the seventh level of hell. I mean, look at this place. Long hours, low wages, dangerous factories with horrific accidents occurring commonly. I mean, we've talked about how dangerous the production of clothing was. Imagine how much worse it must have been for the guys in the steel mills. Good Lord. And here's the thing is that workers rapidly realized after hour eight, after hour nine, when you're halfway through hour 10 in the textile mill, you know, your focus begins to shift. You get blurry, you get tired, you get fatigued, you get careless. And that machine that you're hunched over for 55 hours a week starts to pull you in. That is how bloody dangerous these factories were incredibly dangerous. And Emma Goldman knew firsthand because she worked as a seamstress in one of these factories. But, 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 one of the things that came out of these factories was not just beautiful clothing for the wealthy and the powerful, but cheap, tough, reliable clothing for everyday working people, including the invention of jeans, okay? Patented, riveted clothing made out of heavy denim. Best used for farmers, mechanics, and miners. For pretty much the first time in all of human history, tough, cheap, reliable clothing becomes available for the average person. They can, they can get the Sears Roebuck catalog. They can order two or three pair of denim jeans 
And those denim jeans will serve them quite well. It wasn't just beautiful clothing that came out of these textile mills. It was tough, useful clothing as well. In fact, this is when, Le when uh, Levi Strauss patents uh, the American jeans, you know, which half the world wears at this point. And there we have it, American working men, for the first time, being able to afford tough, reliable clothing because it's coming out of those massive textile mills. And one of the weirdest things that's happened in the last few years has been a resurgence in vintage antique jeans. I'm not talking about jeans from the 1970s or the 1960s or even from the 1950s. I'm talking about jeans from the 1870s because one of the weirder things with denim, this, you know, this, this coarse cloth, is that it actually gets more comfortable the more you wear it. It's kind of like, you know, denim jeans are kind of like leather boots. The more you wear them, the better they fit. And the result is, is that jeans, the older they are, the better quality they become. And one of the more bizarre things that's happened in the last 10 years is that prospectors, modern prospectors, will go into these old steel mills and will go into these old silver mines or copper mines and they're looking for jeans that the workers discarded 150 years ago, 120 years ago. And inside some of these silver mines in the Old West, somebody found a pair of 125-year-old Levi jeans. They were impregnated with silver because the worker had taken them off, probably because they were dirty and he didn't want to mess with them. So the silver miner had taken off these jeans, you know, 125 years ago, put them on one side of the silver mine and had forgotten about them. And then the jeans sit there for 125 years, slowly having silver inter interwoven into the denim jeans. And it was found by one of these prospectors. And recently at auction, I mean, look right up above my head. The jeans sold for a hundred thousand dollars. The most expensive pair of jeans in the world as these old 19th century denim is incredibly valuable. Now we're gonna move on to what exactly America does with all of this wealth and power and production and some of the problems that start to come out of these powerful, productive, dangerous, exploitative factories. But we're gonna do that next time. And I will see you there.